Welcome in to the Triple Play Fantasy Baseball Show. Let's roll. What's going on, everyone? Welcome into the Triple Play Fantasy Baseball Show. Baseball has officially started. Doesn't matter if only two teams played at 6 a.m. on the East Coast. We have our first baseball game that's played. And, you know, we got to do our baseball pod. We have a little bit of a different crew. So I'm going to introduce some of the normalcy we have. And that's with Art Tornaveni, a.k.a. Lil Cheesecake, the LC. How's it going? It's going great today. I am... I am absolutely. I, I can't even. I can't even contain myself. I'm gonna break protocol. Uh, 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 from a podcast I listen to every week because I edit it, and then I listen to it again after I put it out. We got Mike Carter from our very own Fantasy Baseball Beat, the podcast that makes our little pirate ship look a little bit classier on Triple Play. Uh, so happy to have Mike here from uh, from from uh, the fantasy baseball beat i mean look you beat me to it introducing our guest uh and and i guess uh there's a reason we brought mike on as we're talking about our relief pitcher preview today exactly one week before major league baseball big opening day but mike welcome to the show uh you know maybe maybe your first second third fourth fifth time on we've lost track now how's it going Well, you know, I'm doing better than Shohei Otani's uh, interpreter today. That's for sure. Oh, man. That's going to be day. a big What a story. day for that guy, huh? That's going to be a big story. Oh, you're not story. kidding. And he could, you know, he could be a fall guy for some some other things that are going to happen. It's not like people in uh, sports, especially superstars, haven't gambled before. So um, that's going to be a, a topic for another day. We might be able to do a whole podcast <laughs> on that. Um before we go into our relief pitcher preview, though, I'd be remiss to not bring up Underdog because when you use promo code TRIPLE, like we're still raining threes in the NBA regular season. They're going to match your deposit up to $100. Free money. You can't beat it. So once again, use that promo code. But guys, I, I want to just, before we get into our relief pitcher preview, um, you know, that it was 6 a.m. East Coast, 7 a.m. Central time zone. But just kind of opening thoughts from the Dodgers and Padres today, what do you think? You know, it's an, I like that they're doing this. I like that the season started in another part of the world and bringing the greatest game in the world to a variety of different people. It made a lot of sense to me, I felt. Um, I enjoyed it. You know, I was up before 5 and uh, kind of listening to it a little bit and kind of getting into it and – trying to get on track, you know, and I, then I, I realized after the game started, because I'm not terribly bright, as you guys know, that I had not set my fantasy lineups. <laughs> and so I've got, uh, you know, 12 different teams or whatever it is that I have now. And I'm like, crap, I probably should have taken a look at that before the game started. Right. So uh, luckily I was in pretty good shape in most places, but uh, I, I'm ready for it. You know, it's been, it's been great. You know, I'm, um, I'm so busy with baseball all the time, as you guys know. You know, I coach my son's team. I'm coaching at the high school here now in town as well, uh, coaching the freshmen, which is awesome, and having a great time with it. It's just, it's such a huge part of my life that I'm just really excited that MLB is back. Mike, to, there, to what you said, there was something about me drinking my coffee, eating my eggs, watching baseball at like 7.30 in the morning. It was and, and, you know, for people on the East time zone, we never experience this. You know, football games begin at 1 p.m. Mm -hmm. NBA, you know, earliest that will happen is usually like 12 or 1230 for the Christmas games. So it's kind of nice to wake up with that. Um, as someone that doesn't watch a lot of TV outside of sports, uh, I that's typically not part of my morning routine, but I wouldn't complain if it was like that in the future. Art, what were your thoughts? Uh, I just thought it was interesting the way uh, the pitchers were used. Glass now went five. Evan Phillips got the save. Daniel Hudson, someone who I was 
you know, I'm, I'm thinking we might talk about a little bit today as a, as a, as a backup option in the Dodgers bullpen. I was looking at that. Um, you know, Darvish didn't go a lot of innings uh, today. So, you know, basically I was trying to look at how the pitchers were being used and it was nice to see glass not go five in the first game. It was and Darvish uh, went three and two thirds. So we'll, we'll see if, uh, you know, I know he dealt with some off season issues, but mm-hmm. we're not talking about you Darvish and starting pitcher. We're talking about our relief pitchers. And for those that haven't drafted uh, you're, you're in luck because we've dodged a lot of injuries or, a drafter has dodged a lot of potential injuries in the closing landscape. The past week, we've seen Jordan Romano with elbow soreness, with Devin Williams missing three months, with uh, I know there's one more. Uh, Duran. Yeah, yeah Johan Duran beginning the season on the aisle, a popular breakout candidate. So uh, what I want to do is go through the top 10 relief pitchers, and this has been NFBT – drafts over the last week so as we're getting closer to the actual season i'm gonna read off the closers one through ten because they're scattered if i pull up the website josh Hader or edwin diaz is the first closer josh Hader the second emmanuel classe johan duran camilo duvall Razio iglesias jordan romano david bedner alexis diaz and devin williams so three guys that we talked about are still getting drafted in the top 10. Mm -hmm. So before that, David said, don't snub me, read my comment. Uh, Eric, I think you invented a word. It's pronounced normalcy, not like a (laughs) in normalcy. Uh, David, I thought you were tired after coaching softball. There, I read your comments. But going back to the actual content of the show, Mike, I'm going to start with you. Who's a pitcher that you like getting drafted in the top 10? Well, now that they're dropping like flies, you know, um, <laughs> I, I, the guy that I really did like out of this whole group, I mean, I, I, you know, I had a lot of Williams early on. I had a lot of Duran. I liked what you said about him being a breakout candidate. I thought for sure that was going to happen. I'm a little leery of taking a lot of these guys right now, but I really like Camilo Duvall. I think Duvall is really the safest bet of that top 10 right now. Uh, you know, he's got a track record. He's got great ability. We know that he's going to be closing out games for the Giants. The Giants just upgraded their – rotation big time the last couple of days. I'm sure people have been hearing about that with getting Blake Snell, but you know, Duval last year had six wins and 39 saves, 293 ERA, 114 whip. I mean, that's pretty great. Uh, 87 punch outs and 67 and two thirds innings. You know, I, I really like to try to get a hundred strikeouts out of my top, my top relief guy, if I can. And uh, I think he's pretty darn close to that. So the 31% K rate last year, um, he walks a few more guys than you would like, but he really does not give up a lot of home runs. So he had, his walk rate was a little bit up over 9% last year. So it's a little higher than what you would like, but he's also got a great ground ball rate. You know, it was over 52% with his ground ball rate. So that's like 88th percentile. When you go digging around in his stat cast, you see that red that you like to see. He seems to me to be the safest bet of that group. Uh, a guy that I would be targeting as I was going into drafts this week in that top 10. He had... 39 saves and 47 opportunities last year. So, you know, I think with closers, that's the number one thing, right? Are they going to have the opportunities? And then, you know, are they going to be somewhat consistent where you're not having volatile guys? And the first person that came to mind, James uh, Karinchak, a couple of years ago. So Mm -hmm. uh, I think Duvall is a very safe option. Uh, He's only 26 years old. So, you know, you don't have to worry about a potential drop off at that point. Uh, Mike, I think that's a really good option. And, you know, we talk about the, you know, for closers, maybe guys that have thrown a lot of innings, 67.2 over the last two years and 27 before that. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that's what we're seeing a lot now with pitchers in general is a lot of guys that have thrown bulk innings for, you know, years and years on end, the Justin Verlanders, the Garrett Coles, the Kevin Gosmans they're beginning the season a little bit slow and probably won't make, you know, their full appearances. And I know once again, we're talking about relief pitching, but I'm looking at kind of just the cumulative effect. So I'm definitely with you on Camilla Duvall. Art going to you next. Who's the guy that you like? Well, one thing I wanted to point out is that we forgot to mention also that I think David Bednar is dealing with a little bit of injury right now as well. Um, So if you look at where the, the top 10 right now, as far as what we're looking at, 
Uh, Duran's going to drop. Romano's going to drop. Bednar's dropping. Williams is dropping. So who am I looking at? I I find Alexis Diaz to be a little bit risky. I don't like the way he finished mm-hmm. last season. Mm-hmm. So if I'm going to jump into the top 10 here uh, and, and not go with Duvall, because I do I do second Duvall uh, on there. I like going uh, to to right to the top. You know, getting Diaz or Hader. I don't mind going early to get a closer, especially my top one. Um, the value of of a closer in like someone like Diaz who can get you that hundred strikeouts, and Hader who can get you that hundred strikeouts, like Mike talked about, with the nice ratios, is 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 good. And especially how they're dropping, we're gonna have to come up with maybe before the end of the show, we might have to come up with our new top ten where we take out all these people who are <laughs> falling out. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that might be <laughs> something we need to do because four of these guys at least are dropping out of the top ten. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting. I used the last week because I felt like that was a decent amount of sample size that, you know, is longer than the uh, Devin Williams news came out. Uh, You know, Jordan Romano obviously was the uh, past couple days ago, but I mean, yeah, this isn't, this isn't encouraging before the season starts. So let me ask you guys, you remember a very long time ago, AKA last year when (laughs) pitchers, AKA closers were getting taken in the second round, how that was a popular strategy led by some of the very best fantasy baseball players over the last week. Edwin Diaz is being drafted as the top closer an ADP of 48, which would be uh, the beginning of the fourth round, a min pick of 25 and Josh Hader, a min pick of 31, but an ADP of 53. So middle of the fourth round. With the way that closers are dropping like flies, would you take those guys earlier if you were drafting today? I'm going to just jump in and say, for me, no, I'm not going to go earlier on them because um, I'm going to, I will, I would rather go with a hitter earlier than like, in the, in the second round, I think, I don't think, I think second round is probably too early for them this year. What do you think yeah. the change, uh, Mike here, on, um, jump in, jump in. I didn't mean to cut you off. No, no, no. That's okay. Please. Are you kidding me? I get cut off all day. It's not a problem. <laughs> I was going to ask what changed between this year to last year where you would maybe take a closer in the second round. And now you're debating not taking a closer in the fourth. And there's hypothetically, less Mm -hmm. safer options there. Yeah. I think, I think it's an interesting thing to think about, right? We have a situation where we, we really saw less volatility last year in the closer role itself, right? We, we saw more people hold on to the job for longer periods of time, which really makes drafting a closer early be not a great strategy necessarily. I think a lot of it to me depends on the nature of your league and what you know about the people in your league. If you're playing in a league like Glar for, or you know, one of the Earth League places like that, or TGFBI, you know, you're going to be competing against really good people who really understand the, the, these things. And and I'm not saying the people in home leagues don't. I, I play in some pretty good home leagues too, where people really understand these things at a high level. However, I think that when you look at the options and start thinking, how much difference is there between Edwin Diaz and say Paul Seawald? I would say that the difference is actually shrinking not just because of injury, but just because of the fact that I really just want to get somebody that's going to have the job and the opportunity and it's going to get, you know, 25, 30, 35 saves if I can in there. And some of that other stuff is gravy when you think about guys like Diaz, but I agree with what Artie said. I mean, I think you're, the the idea of passing up on a hitter, I mean, if you were in the third round, would you rather dra- draft Frankie Lindor or would you rather have Edwin Diaz? I mean, I'd rather have Lindor every day of the week and twice on Sunday. You know, that's just I me. Take, I would maybe take and Diaz. I'm a little bit more skeptical on, you know, missed uh-huh. last year. Um, uh-huh. I think Hater is in a class of his own. Do you the what they were talking about last year at the um, first pitch Arizona? And I think it was Rob Silver that was talking about chasing wins. Mm-hmm. And I kind of correlate that to saves as well. You know, mm-hmm. I mean, think about the premium that the Astros just paid for Josh Hader and essentially bumped Ryan Presley and we all knew it was coming. And, and Ryan mm-hmm. Presley, I, I'm not going to say is the best closer, you know, obviously he was really great a couple of years ago, great ratios, but 
Um, I think barring injury, Josh Hader is, is going to be a top two or three closer. And, you know, if you could get someone at that position and, in, and, in, in a roto, you know, five by five league, that's way mm -hmm. the same, especially mm -hmm. with, you know, Lindor that's coming off elbow surgery. Right. Right. I might, I might lean that direction. It gives me a little bit of pause with Hader and I'll tell you why. And it's not because of a skill deficit. Um, you know, it's that they have Ryan Presley and Brian Abreu there too. And their, their goal was to play deep into the playoffs. And I could definitely see a scenario where Presley eats into that save total a little bit, maybe gets 10 or 12 and maybe Abreu gets three or four. Obviously Abreu is a, a valuable guy in, in saves and holds leagues. And, and that's the one thing that gives me pause with that doc is just the idea of, you know, does he really get all of their save chances? I don't think he's going to. And I think that they're going to, really be careful with how they treat him because they want to get deep in the playoffs. I won't argue with the bullpen guy on that. I know when to pick and choose my battles. Um, <laughs> no, we can talk about anything, bro. Like <laughs> seriously, it's a, just an opinion. You know, it's not like I have some crystal ball and can see in the future. If I did, I'd be winning a hell of a lot more money playing fantasy. You wouldn't be on this podcast with us low lives. Um, Martin mm -hmm. brings up a good point too on Camilo Duvall going back to that argument. He only made two multi-inning appearances last season. They really protect him and use him when it's a true high leverage situation. And I think that line, or that team on paper looks better than last year, which maybe gives him more than 47 save opportunities. And mm -hmm. um, how do you guys say uh, Kate Upton's husband's last name? Verlander. Yeah, Verlander. Verlander. You, oh. really, you really emphasize the land on there. Well, I think, it, I think it's an East. I, I think it's an East Coast thing. I don't I, I, know I, any other way to say it. Verlander. 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 Yeah. There you go. There you go. Okay, so I need to put more emphasis on the beginning. On the it's, okay. it's okay. It's Artie and I are Chicago people, so <laughs> no. we have a we have a different accent than you do. This comes on more often than not, so uh, I I need to know how to correct it for the future. And we know Vinny is watching because he corrects it. There you go, Justin it reminds Verlander. Me it reminds me of when Christopher Walken was on SNL and he was talking about the Foo Fighters. Foo Fighters. <laughs> Art, you had brought up a name earlier. Mm -hmm. Yes. And you are not a fan of him this year. I, I know a lot kind of plays into the meltdown he had in the second half. Uh, you know, the, the fatigue he had. This was his first year being a closer. He is brothers of Edwin Diaz, uh, 37 saves and 40 chances last year. The Reds have taken a lot of hits to their hitting. Mm -hmm. uh, Matt McClain going down. There's a good chance he's out for an extended period of time. Uh, mm -hmm. TJ Friedel, broken wrist. Noel V. Marte, 80 game suspension. Maybe they don't have as much padding. I, you know, I think games are going to be close for them. Um, you know, are you out on Edwin Diaz or Alexis Diaz just because of how it was last year in the spring training? I, I know it's been bad, 9.53 RA in about six innings. Um, but it, is there anything else I'm missing on him? I The way he finished last season, his walk rate jumped up in the second half. Uh, his his ERA jumped up in the second half. His you know the the slugging he gave up jumped up in the second half. I think he was overused last season. Um, and so I, I, to me, that just, uh, when, when a person experiences a degradation towards the second half, because I feel like they are overused, I, I then come into the next season with the idea that they, that they might have experienced some sort of an overuse injury towards the end of last mm -hmm. season and be more injury prone this season that I'm, I don't have any sort of data that I can point to, to back that up. But if I, I do feel like if, if I feel that I watch someone and they're doing worse because they've been overused the next season. I definitely always remember that as I'm coming to the draft for Alexis Diaz, I'm going to take him now above certain closes, but I think I would rather just pass on him because there are guys after him guys like Pete Fairbanks and um, Craig Kimbrell, who I, I really like going shortly after him and I'm not worried. I'm not as worried about them. Um, and maybe I'm foolishly worried about Alexis Diaz, but the way he finished just made me very worried. Yeah. So the one thing I will say about Alexis Diaz, I think you, you could say that second half, but it really boils down to September and October, uh, 9.2 innings and 8.38 ERA, 
282 batting average against because when you look the month before in August, 10.1 innings, a 2.61 ERA, 1.61 batting average against. Uh, I look at a guy that over the first half of the season gave up one home run in 40 innings, playing in great American small park that had a 401 ERA at home, which I think is pretty good for a closer once again in Cincinnati, a 2.14 road ERA. Uh, I, I think obviously anytime you play in a stadium like that, uh, you know, there's a little bit of a higher risk for blowups, uh, you know, just with home runs and, mm-hmm. and any sort of runs that can score, you know, I, every run matters for a relief pitcher's ERA. It's not like a starter where you pitch so much that you can make that up. My hope is that he's the main guy in Cincinnati and at 27 years old and 37 saves last season that he builds on that. I do know that there is some risk with him, but I'm looking at him being the ninth ranked closer. And then the guys after that, Seawald, who I have concerns about, Andres Munoz, who had his own injuries. Pete Fairbanks has his own injuries. Evan Phillips, I like, but I think he's one of those. I think he's kind of that cutoff where it's like, this could be the last workhorse bullpen guy, where maybe you don't have to worry about a committee. Mike, I don't know if you feel different. No, you know, I think you guys brought up both bring up really good points about Diaz. I mean, it's a it's a study in contrast and a study of two ha- uh, not even really two halves, like you said, Doc. I mean, I think the thing that I really think about here is what you brought up earlier, which is the idea of uh, of opportunity. And when you look at their bullpen and you see what they have behind him, I mean, Emilio Pagan and Lucas Sims, who I am a Lucas Sims truther. Uh, I always have been. I think if given an opportunity, he would be an outstanding closer. Uh, but I think that the Reds really don't have a lot of other weapons here in that bullpen at this time, guys that are ready to kind of come in and take that role away. And because of that, I think, and because of the injuries that are in front of us here with the guys in the top 10, Diaz represents an interesting buying opportunity because if people want to look at that last month and a half of his work, they're missing out on things like a 30.1% K percentage, which is uh, a pretty good percentage to have. The the walks are, are a bother, but to your point too, Doc, if he keeps the ball in the ballpark, maybe the walks aren't such a big deal. A 12.6% walk rate for me as a closer is unacceptable, but given the risk that we have here and given the idea that he could be the last of one of those workhorses, it's not a bad bet at this point to bet on Alexis Diaz. Agreed. Yeah, I, I think I think that the the worry is baked into the price already. I I really do. I think if if you weren't worried about how he finished, he'd probably be going 20, 20 picks sooner. Mm-hmm. Um, so I do think that there is a little bit of that baked into the price. I just would rather I just would rather him slip a little bit further for me to take him. But I I I've, I think he's a fine pick for all the reasons you guys chose. But to me, I just. I just pass on him every time, and and mm-hmm. and I and that's just my draft strategy. Mm-hmm. And your strategy is wrong. Just messing with the LC. <laughs> I, I, I want to talk about the guys, and and obviously they have different timelines. Devin Williams is missing three months. Mm-hmm. Jordan Romano, it doesn't sound like there's anything structural, and maybe it's day to day. They ease him in the season. Uh, he doesn't pitch every save opportunity. And Johan Duran with an oblique issue. I mean, we've seen those range from four to six weeks. Uh, where are you taking these guys? Are you drafting them at all right now? Well, I think, you know, Williams is one you got to stay away from because, you know, our good friend Dave Funnel uh, is suggesting that he doesn't think Williams is going to pitch at all this year. And so to me, that's a little concerning. I think of the guys that we're, that we're talking about here, the one that I'm – most interesting still is Duran. I, I just think that if he comes back, if even if he misses a month, uh, this is a guy that's still going to be a lights out closer. They've got some issues there too with health in their bullpen. And so I, they're going to want him back uh, as soon as he's ready, I would guess. And so Duran would be a guy that I would be interested in probably the back third of my draft. Um, I think in a draft that I was in last night, he came, he came up in an auction and I think he went for about, I think he went for about 11 or 12 bucks, which seemed appropriate. Um, I already had my closer allotment there because I just went for guys that were healthy last night, essentially. But 
Duran would be a guy that I would still be interested in there. Um, I, you know, it's just very concerning. The Romano thing, you know, he had the back. Now he's got this elbow thing. Like when he's on, he's as good as there is. But boy, it's a little concerning, you know. Um, I, I think I would probably go in that order. I probably would go Duran, then Romano, um, and then um, Williams probably last of that group. Bednar, you know, I, I haven't heard a lot about Bednar lately. So I, I don't know if no news is good news. I'm guessing it's not. I felt the opposite. Yeah, I feel like I feel like things get leaked out when there's bad news. Yeah, could be, could be. I I'm of I'm I'm in agreement with Mike. Duran's my my favorite. He has the oblique. It's not an arm related injury, although I do think that obliques often have that sort of what the like the body chain. This part's connected to that part, therefore tweaking the the oblique leads to other. Um, the oblique bone connects to yeah, the like, shoulder bone, right? Like compensation mm-hmm. injuries often obliques just just do tend to linger and um but Duran for me is the most I most uh, most appealing. I don't like Romano's that it's his elbow that's inflamed. Yeah. I also am looking at I think that Toronto has options behind him in the pen. I like the way Nate mm-hmm. Pearson has been pitching. I think Yimi Garcia is a decent option. So I think for the beginning of the season, the first fab runs on my my leagues that are, have already gone, I'm going to be looking in the Toronto pen for some early saves that I could possibly pick up. You know, I can't help when I see Johan Duran to think of that band Duran Duran. Uh-huh. Yeah, I um, really like the wolf, baby. Yeah. What I think is interesting, I want you guys to give me your best guess. What do you think Johan Duran's max pick is over the last week? Hmm. Okay, so I I think I know this already because I was looking that up. All right, then let Mike guess first. His max pick? His max pick. Mm. Boy, that's a tough one. I don't know. A um, 100, 120? Art, what's your guess? I think it's 225. 379. Wow. Wow. Yeah, I'll take some. So there is at least one draft where people are really afraid of him. And I think the point that Mike and uh, Art make is is valid, that it's an oblique issue. It's not a a shoulder or an arm. Uh, We haven't heard anything not alarming. So, you know, obviously he's not going to begin the season pitching, but, you know, he could now be a a great value. You know, I I think at 379, that's a no-brainer. But even past, you know, pick 150, he could still be available based on what we've seen. So uh, I, I really like that. Um, go into the next range of guys, the 11 through 20, mm-hmm. Paul Seawald, Andres Munoz, Pete Fairbanks, Evan Phillips, Ryan Helsley, Clay Holmes, Craig Kimbrell, Ad- Adbert Adzale, Kenley Jansen, and Jose Alvarado. Uh, so another list of guys, some play on good teams, some are veterans, uh, some there's some question marks for art. I'm going to go with you. Who's someone in this range that you are intrigued by? I like a lot in this range. Actually, I think this is a good range to go shopping in for your closers. The first guy I want to bring up is someone who I think will be rising up the boards and that's Pete Fairbanks. He was healthy. He had a few minor injuries in the first half of last year that took him out for about a total of a month. Mm-hmm. But after, I th- I want to say mid-May or June, he was healthy for the rest of the season. And so I feel like Fairbanks is coming into camp healthy. He got the majority of Tampa Bay's save chances, which is, you know, for them, that's a good, you know, that's a new new sort of take on their bullpen usage. But I like I like his pitching. I like his ratios. I like their team. They have a team that should produce a lot of save chances as well. Uh, Fairbanks, I think, is going to be climbing up draft boards, and I want a piece of him now. So, Art, let me ask you. Pete Fairbanks has never thrown more than 45 innings in a season. Mm-hmm. Does that concern you at all? I mean, we're we're talking about over the course of five years, and, and I mean, obviously, including the COVID year as well, but that's a pretty big sample size. I mean, do you expect him to have that huge jump? And for a huge jump for a closer, that could be even getting in the 60s or 70s. I, I don't necessarily expect him to have any jump. He produced 25 saves in 45 innings last year. Um, I could see him producing 25 to 30 saves in a similar amount of innings this year 
in one inning stints um, with the way they use him. So I, 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 yeah, I, I think if he hadn't missed a month last year, he would have been in the fifties or low sixties innings. But um, I don't think the fact that he did not produce a lot of innings last year, I know Kenley had 29 saves on 44 innings last year as well. Closers are just not getting the innings that they used to get. So um, as long as he's their main closer for most of the season, he will be producing a lot of saves. I also want to ask, does he look 30 to you? He looks like an <laughs> old 30. What? That's a baby I, face. That is not a baby face. I'm, I'm seeing some gray hair, some wrinkles. I ain't, I ain't talking smack about anybody looking old. I, I'm just saying I'm two months from turning 30 and I thought I look relatively young and uh, I can't believe him and I are within a calendar year apart. Um, just just thank, thank goodness for your genetics, okay? <laughs> I, I will say, uh, and I'll speak for Marty because I know this is a big target of his. Marty has been drafting a lot of Jason Adam in later rounds. Uh, you know, somebody that mm-hmm. will help your ratios mm-hmm. uh, that might be the next in lineup. Uh, for Tampa Bay. Another thing I worry about with Tampa Bay and, and Art, I'm not trying to pick on you with this pick. I feel like they've overachieved for years. Like you look at the team they have on paper and last year they had a really great schedule to begin. I think they began 13 and 0. Uh, you know, a team that wins close games that grits and grinds. But I look at the talent mm-hmm. they have this year. They obviously don't have Wander Franco. Josh Lowe's beginning the year on the IL. I just look at their lineup from a one through nine and I just don't see as much talent as I have in years past. And that in turn worries me about the amount of save opportunities. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I take a different look at that in that they're going to be playing in a lot of close games. I think they're still going to be above 500 team with a chance to be back in the playoff hunt again, but it's going to be close games for them. So I think there's save opportunities there. There's like a, if someone, I forget, I'm, I'm not going to get this, this, this reference, right. But, but 105 win teams often produce less save opportunities than like 85 win teams mm-hmm. because 85 win teams win closer games than 105 win teams. So to me, it, it almost could, could bring, um, more save opportunities to be, you know, a less dominant team, if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I mean, do you see them even being an 85 win team? I feel like at some point they're going to be under 500. And eh, maybe that's just me speculating. Yeah, that's interesting to think about. I mean, I, I like the idea of, uh, you know, Fairbanks is a guy that um, he's got this thing called Raynaud syndrome, which uh, allows him to have, problems with his fingers when in cold weather it happened to him in chicago last year uh when they was pitching up here and he was unavailable for periods of time because of the cold weather because he couldn't feel his fingertips which is what the rainouts does um doc you talked you touched on somebody that was interesting to go with that if you had if you did a situation where you took a, a guy like fairbanks and say paired him with a just for lack of a better person craig kimbrell and then came back and spent a pick on adam you know, you're, you're locking up the vast majority of what Tampa saves are going to be. You're probably going to have a situation where Adam, you know, last year did a really ad, uh, admirable job filling in for Fairbanks when he was unable to go. That's a nice way to kind of corner the market on uh, one team saves if you feel good about that. So I don't it's think that's a bad like, strategy at all. It, it's kind of like when you take a, a running back in fantasy football and you take their handcuff, you know, so that mm-hmm. if they get injured – because I think the one thing about saves, you know, for, for starting pitchers and for hitters, they don't have a direct replacement for the most time. You know, they, they'll, they have their one through nine or there's guys that they platoon, but just because their platoon partner gets hurt doesn't necessarily mean they're going to see a huge crease, increase in at-bats. But with saves, it's kind of like that next man up. Like usually the setup guy then becomes the closer, mm-hmm. and that's a huge help in, in a categories league because – Obviously, the ratios are important, but if you can get the ratios and a save, uh, mm-hmm. you know that that player becomes a lot more valuable. Uh, Mike, staying in this range, who is a guy that you like? Let me let me throw a stat at you. I know I, I bet you guys. Well, maybe you know this. I shouldn't say. I, I was gonna say I bet you guys don't know this, but maybe you do. 
in the last three seasons, there are only four closers that have ERAs under three, a strikeout rate over 33%, and over 50 saves in those four years, or three years. Any Anybody care to venture a guess as to who those guys are? Because one of them is a guy I'm going to bring up. I feel like I'll it has to you. be quick. So like over, be. over 50 saves. What are the criteria again? ERA under three. Let's just leave it this way. ERA under three, strikeout rate over 33%. Golly. Seawald? See, Paul Seawald is the guy that I'm bringing up here. The other guys were Hader, uh, wow. Devin Williams, and, and Rizal Iglesias. But wow. I want to talk I want to talk about Seawald because I don't think Seawald gets any love. And I know that there's a lot of people that are, I don't want to say anti-Seawald, but um, doubt him. And, and I, I'll say this, you know, he had 34 saves last year uh, on a team that made it to the World Series and whether they belonged in the World Series or not. But uh, he, had, he did a really great job for them last year. He had uh, 80 strikeouts and 60 and two thirds innings, which I love. 32.1% strikeout rate. So he's a little bit below 33% that we talked about uh, a, a minute ago. And uh, he limits hard contact, which is something that I think that is um, an underrated stat that we don't look at enough when it comes to closers you know his average exit velocity was like 86 miles an hour last year which was uh, really really good in in that realm so I, I think he's really started pitching a little bit differently and it kind of flew under the radar a little bit he was really throwing his fastball at the top of the zone and and really got rid of the the, the slider and started using a, a sweeper and and that really made a big difference in his bottom line which was that he was really, really good. <laughs> I mean, they've got Kevin Ginkle there, who a lot of people say has better stuff. He's obviously got higher velocity, but they seem really uh, kind of lock in step with Seawald. And I think, to me, he's a guy that kind of flies under the radar, but could easily sneak into the top 10 as well with a, a successful start to the year. Or he, he could be on the bench with guy, uh, somebody like Ginkle or Saw Frank or somebody like that stepping up into a higher role, but I, I like Seawald where he's going at this point. I'll have I'll be honest. Uh, I was a little bit of a Seawald doubter, and I look at his fan graphs page, and I mean everything you said is true. Uh, Mike, I guess one of the concerns I have, I'm looking at his home runs per nine, even in mm-hmm. uh, you know pitcher friendly parks, Seattle, a 1.3 run home, 1.39 home runs per nine, 2021, 1.41 in 2022. Um, you know, obviously with closers, you're not pitching as many innings. So those numbers are a little bit skewed. Um, but I think sure. also the, the catch 22 of it, you're coming in for safe situations. We have a three run lead max. Does that worry you at all that he's given up so many home runs? Not really. I, you know, I don't look as closely at that kind of, kind of stuff as I do what I'm looking for with the strikeout minus walk rate and the different things like that. I mean, I, I think he's um, he's pitched pretty close to his peripherals the last three years since he's really gotten into the closer role. His walk rate's a little higher than you would like, but you can live with it when you've got other things that are really helping out. The, the, the low exit velocity, the, the hard hit rate is, is, is low, which is under 30%, which is great. Uh, th- strikeout rate was over 32%. You know, it was he actually was better at last year than he was in 22. So, yeah, it's concerning, but I mean, you know, his 95th percentile K rate and um, his ground ball rate's not very good, which is a little bit of a concern, as you're saying. So, I, you know, it's something to watch, but he's still kind of in the prime of it. I think he's got another good year left in him at 33, and I think the Diamondbacks really trust him to be the guy. Yeah, I think he's going to have a longer leash, especially them getting to the World Series. I don't think they want to change up too much. At least I wouldn't. Uh, if I was in a front office and general manager position. and um, But just to note, 28 home runs given up over the last three seasons as opposed to 20 home runs over the first four seasons. Obviously, a uh, change in innings pitched, but just uh, kind of from the numbers trait. Um, let's talk about Evan Phillips, the saves leader right now. Uh, <laughs> you know, some, somebody that I think last year we didn't necessarily know what we were going to get with him. You know, the... The Dodgers had gone with Kenley Jansen so long, and I, I think nobody really knew exactly what they were going to see in terms of a replacement. Uh, you know, some people thought Gratterall, some 
people thought it would be a committee. And, you know, in comes in Evan Phillips, who gives you great ratios. Um, you know, if you drafted him right now, like I said, he's already contributing in that category. But if you haven't drafted yet, is that somebody that you're targeting? I love him. And, I, and you know, I, I'm not usually – I try not to use vulgarity in, when we do these podcasts and things like that. But Go ahead. People shit all over this guy. And, <laughs> and I and I, I don't get it. I don't – I don't – you know, the, there are people – the problem, I think, is that we get in love with this idea of guys that have high velocity and th- automatically think that they're going to be locked down closers, right? You got a guy like Gratterall. Gratterall's got the as good a velocity as anybody in the game, right? But – it's because his ball dives and the way that he throws the sinker that he's getting a lot of ground ball outs, right? So Phillips is the guy who's closing there. They trust him to close there. Yes, they have other options. Blake Trinan is coming at some point if they need him. Hudson is there. They've got a lot of veteran guys that are going there. But but Dave Roberts is using this guy as the closer. The problem that you have is that he's not going to have the high strikeout rate that other guys do. He's not going to get a lot of wins. And he's going to get saves. I mean, I, he had 24 last year. He could have had more than that. He limits walks. He limits damage. His K percentage is 28.2. Is it the best? No. But that's 83rd percentile still anyway. He really has got pretty good fastball velocity too, even though he doesn't strike out a ton of guys. Um, I think he's growing into the job. Obviously, he's on a team that's going to win a, a, a boatload of games, it would appear like. Uh you know, and and so I I feel like he kind of flies under the radar. People are like, oh God, I'll take Phillips as like maybe my third guy or like a second. But you know, he can make a pretty good case that he's going to get thirty saves with really good ratios and help you out. And just because he doesn't get a lot of strikeouts, somebody's going to uh, bump him down. But some of the guys on the ranking sheet that you that we're talking of here, Eric. I mean, I I would rather have him than several of the guys that are on that list. Like. I, I'm not a big Andres Munoz guy as good as he is. I'm not a big Alexis Diaz guy as he is. I'm really not a big Al Zalai guy right now just because of the injury stuff that happened last year and the fact that Council's been so mum about who's closing. So based on the guys that are in here, I mean, Phillips is a really good deal, I think, uh, where he's going in drafts right now. Evans Phillips, 24 out of 27 saves last year, six holds, and Mike, you had mentioned, 24 saves last year, he had three coming into Mm -hmm. that. So we really didn't know what we were going to get from him. And I think we saw that Dave Phillips or um, Dave Roberts trust him. I combined the names for a second. And, uh, and, and I think he was a value last season. And, you know, it's interesting. Chris Bassett uh, was on a podcast the other day and he was talking about how there's such a uh, fixation with people throwing fast and that 91, 92, isn't glamorous and that a guy with a lower ERA at 91, 92 miles per hour won't get the same respect or an invitation back with a guy with one full, one full run higher on their ERA, but can throw 97, Mm -hmm. 98. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. And and I think a lot of pitchers that are closers uh, rely on velocity. And I don't think Evan Phillips is that type of guy. So uh, I'm with you. I think he's a value He's going to be on a team that's going to give him a lot of save opportunities, and I don't see anybody taking that. It is worth noting that uh, Gratterall is injured to begin the season. Correct. Looking at one more guy on this list. Actually, I, I you know, Mike, you talked about a couple of people you didn't like on here. Art, is there anyone in this 11 to 20 range you're fading? You said there's a lot of people you're liking, but is there a certain guy that maybe you're not touching? Ryan Helsley. Like, I just – I, the fact that he's uh, he he fought through some injuries last year, they were really concerned about pitching him on back to back days. Uh, um, I don't know if they've committed to having him as the closer, uh, but I do worry about the durability of his arm. I don't think that you know, even if he is with the team the whole season, I don't think he's like a thirty save guy. Even if he is most of their close, I think he's like a. 20 save guy because they're going to spread the saves around as well even so hells is a guy i'm staying away from because i i do worry about his his arm uh, and his durability and i do worry that he's not going to be getting all the saves mm-hmm. correct me if i'm wrong and mike maybe you'll notice because you're our bullpen guy here at triple play fantasy uh and you're not allowed to do that anywhere else 
Um, <laughs> didn't, didn't, didn't he have forearm issues last year and he just kind of did a rest and rehab protocol rather than like anything surgical related? Yeah. You know, he was, have, he had issues with his hand at the end of the season and, uh, he struggled with a variety of different little nitpicky types of things, but uh, he's looked good so far. Uh, it, it looks like the rest and recuperation actually did him good. And and I think the thing that kind of gets lost in all this is that when you have a guy like Helsley who had a 22 like he had where he was just incredible, right? I mean, he had like nine wins. He had like 19 saves. He had the microscopic ERA and whip. And they had one of the best seasons ever for a relief pitcher. One of the best seasons, a top three relief season in 22. And then we automatically assume, because we want to drink the Kool-Aid, right? We want to believe that he's going to be able to do that again the following year. And he was he had a pretty good year last year when you really look at it, other than only pitching in 36 innings. The fact that he did not finish strong is a bit of a concern and that he did have those injuries. But when you look at, you know, when you kind of take a, look, a deeper dive into what's going on there in St. Louis and Ali Marmol, who doesn't seem to want to commit to a lot of different things, they also have uh, Giovanni Gallegos, who has got some closing experience. And they also added Andrew Kittredge in a trade with Tampa uh, in January to uh, add to that mix. And Kittredge also has that experience, although he's significantly older. And Jojo Romero, who's not a closer, I'm sorry. He's just, I mean, he's fine guy to have in your bullpen, but he's not a closer. I think Helsley probably gets 80% of these saves as long as he's healthy. They really prefer to use Gallegos in a, in a stopper role. Uh, and Kittredge, I think, can help there too. They really don't have a lot of other options than that. So if Helsley is healthy, uh, I think it's his job. Mike, you talk about drinking the Kool-Aid, and I mean, you you hit the nail on the head with his 2022 stats. Nine wins, 19 saves, seven holds, nine earned runs mm -hmm. given up in 65 innings. Six of those earned runs uh, coming from home runs. He did not give up a run his first 14 appearances. First appearance being mm -hmm. April 7th. The first outing that he gave up a run was... May 30th against the Padres. Um, so you look at that and I mean, that that's a utter dominance. I think only maybe Josh Hader has had that electric of a run when you're talking about the ratios. Um, but on the flip side of that, he hasn't had more than 20 saves in the season. He had mm -hmm. 14 last year. Do we know if he can go long into games? Yes, there might not be better options there. And he threw 36 innings last year, but you know, 64, 65 was what we saw in 2022, but mm -hmm. he hasn't been over the 50 mark. And I, I understand he's 29. It's not, you know, we're not putting the nail in the coffin mm -hmm. on the peak of his career, but um, he's an interesting guy for me. I, I've kind of gone back and forth about if I want to draft him. If not, I think he is more appropriate, pr appropriately priced this year because I think there was a lot of helium last year mm -hmm. at his ADP. Mm -hmm. I agree. I think I think the one thing that I that I do like in the places where I have him, I have him in a couple of places, and it was where he really kind of fell to me when I already had a top tier closer. So I thought this is not a bad risk to take because if he pops back into what we think he could do, I I might have 65, 70, 75 saves between my top closer and him. So I, I think in, in one league, maybe that closer got hurt. <laughs> it could be one of the top guys. I don't remember which league it was now, but in a place where you might have, let's say that you roll the dice and you not, not roll the dice, but you, you get a guy like hater at the, at the front end and you think, okay, there's my 30 to 35. And then you get to like the 14th or 15th round and Helsley's there. I think that's a great place to take them. Agreed. Agreed. Um, we're getting close to the 50 minute mark here. So we're going to go to a relief pitcher or a couple relief pitchers Beyond the 20th ranked, and keep in mind, a lot has changed with injury news. The Milwaukee bullpen is open. Uh, the Minnesota bullpen is open. You know, we don't know the news about David Bednar, so you might take stabs on someone like a Aroldis Chapman. Uh, Mike, mm -hmm. I'm going to start with you. Who are some guys that you're targeting later in your drafts that you think could get you some saves? 
Yeah, I got a couple of guys, I think, for you, depending on, the, you know, the level of league that you're in and context. And another guy we were talking about, Phillips, that gets uh, that got shit all over is uh, Alex Lang in Detroit. And I I really think that um, Detroit's done some nice things uh, in rebuilding that bullpen. You know, Foley is a good guy to have as a setup guy. Shelby Miller is there, too, who's a guy that you might not want to avoid taking a dollar uh, flyer on at the end of a draft. But Lang's got this really great curveball. He just he doesn't strike people as the type of guy that you think is going to be the closer, but he did finish the year last year as the closer in Detroit, and um, he he did have some some problems uh, with with certain things. Uh, he had a, he had a whiff percentage of uh, about forty nine percent. A curveball he throws about fifty nine percent of the time. A good fifty one percent ground ball rate. The sinker he throws to righties and and it's been effective change up to get lefties out too. Uh, so I like that. The problem that we have here is a 15.6% walk percentage. I mean, eat gads. I mean, Jack Carter's walk percentage is way better than that, right? So you, you don't want that guy coming in with, you know, and, and adding to the mess that you might have there. And it's a, it's a terrible, terrible thing. But let's say, for example, that he cuts that in half. Let's say that he cuts that 15% walk rate to 7 or 8%. You got a you got a top closer, you got a guy that can really do the job there. And Detroit's going to be better than people think that they are. Uh, shout out to Marty Tallman, um, but I think I think that he's a guy that really kind of flies under the radar. That people will say, "Oh, that's one guy I don't want, no matter what happens." And I think that's a mistake. I think it's a mistake to say that you have a list of guys that you will not take in certain situations. Like I think as players, we have to be open to the possibilities that come to us. And if you're in a situation where you either wait on the position or you get down to it and say, oh, I'd really like to add a third guy here, Lang's a really good guy to add in there. Uh, and I like him a lot. Another guy that I really like too, um, it, it, especially with the Tanner Scott thing is is an iffy thing to me. And I don't think enough people are talking about that. You know, he's, a, he's a little bit of a scary guy. Um, his September was insane. He won a lot of people leagues in September last year and October with, I think he had like three wins and like nine of his saves in the same month or the same like five week period. But the guy there that, you know, with puck moving to the rotation, that really opens up a spot for Andrew Nardi. And Nardi is a nasty guy um, who definitely could take on that role if something were to happen to Scott or even if Scott's effective and they decide to trade him, Nardi's the guy that could step in. Uh, he had eight wins last year, 17 holes and three saves, 2670 ERA, 115 whip. Um, another guy who limits ex- who limits hard contact, exit velocity, 84.6 per, um, miles per hour, almost at percent. It's been a long day. 92nd percentile K percentage of almost 31%. So this is a guy that could easily step into that role uh, should it become vacated somehow. But, you know, Scott, you know, he had an outing a couple of weeks ago. I mean, maybe 10 days ago where he didn't get anybody out. <laughs> I mean, he, he came in and I think he walked like, I think he either walked like three guys and then and gave, or four walks and like gave up three runs or something like that. Uh, and it's cause for concern, right? I mean, that's long been his bugaboo. And last year he controlled it, right? He went from 16% walk rate to 7.8%, right? So, and had a great year. So those of you that are listening, put that together with Lang, like we were just talking about, right? Lang could do that. He could end up being a really top closer. Scott's a guy that I feel is being overdrafted. I've seen him be the fifth or sixth guy off the board, and I think that that's way too high a price. So those are two guys that I really like. And the last one I will throw at you is a dart throw. You guys know I'm a White Sox fan. I got to do something about this White Sox bullpen, which is an abomination. Uh, I think – uh, Jordan Leisure is a guy that's a rookie that uh, probably will not close initially, and they also have Michael Kopech in the bullpen. and And I don't no. believe in, no. I don't believe I don't believe I'm going to say something though. I don't believe in touting my own horn. But in October of last year, I said to the to you guys here and other people, they're going to put him back in the bullpen, and that's the only time he's ever been successful as a pitcher in the major leagues is in a multi inning role. I think a lot of people are making a mistake in drafting Kopech as a closer right now, but I really do think that at this point, I would be surprised if in six weeks that Jordan Leisure is not the closer for the White Sox. Oh, I, I'll take that. I'll take. I'll, I agree with Kopech slander. I I um 
I was looking at the White Sox bullpen, and <clears throat> you know, there's there's some like Brebbia had a good season last year. He did, and, and he could be. You know, he had like the the K percentage of a closer. I I'm I have some wishful drafting of Kopech in my drafts earlier this year. So, uh, but I uh, but yeah, th- that that position, the 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 White Sox closer, is something that I was hoping to to you know spark something with Kopech. But uh, yeah, leisure. I thought the reason I I was against leisure is because I thought there might be some of that arbitration. Uh, saves mm-hmm, uh, mm-hmm. jacking up the price uh, uh-huh. um, problem for leisure, but uh, but I did like I did like what he's been doing so far. My only not, thought was, go ahead. He, he's not a young guy, you know. A lot of people think yeah. leisure is like one of these twenty-one or twenty-two year old guys, but they got him in the Lance Lynn and Joe Kelly trade. He's almost twenty-six years old. They've got no reason to not throw him out there and give him a shot. Sorry, to cut you off. No, no, I, I, I just, I, I, my only, yeah, like I said, I, I only thought possibly arbitration issues would cause leisure not mm-hmm. to get it. That was mm-hmm. my only concern. It's a great other, point. Other guys late in the draft who I like the San Diego bullpen is something I want to, I want to really get in on. I think Suarez has a good chance of holding on to it, but I wouldn't mind going after Matsui either. Um, I think they're, they're both going late enough to be good specs. Estevez in for the Angels. Also, with Robert Stevenson missing the start of the season, Estevez is going to have a chance to uh, get out to a good start and hold on to the Angels' position. The Royals also have late guys. I I I know MacArthur is probably the better pitcher, but I also I think Will Smith is going to get the first chance at the closer right. position. So you know when you get your saves, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if you get them in May or April or in September. So Will Smith getting the early saves, I think I'm going to go after some of those a little bit myself. Mm-hmm. Uh, otherwise, um, Milwaukee, you know, I I don't know. I think Piamps is probably the best bet for Milwaukee. But uh, the latest pick is uh, which Taylor Miguel. Or is it Trevor? Which McGill is so it? When we when we look at Abner Uribe, and I'm bringing it up because uh, Vinny brought him up. Yeah. Uh, over the last week, the 139th pitcher going off the board, to keep in mind this includes starters, uh, a min pick of 237, a max pick of 533. And then when we look at Mr. Piamps, um, ADP of 114, so he's going higher, a min pick of 170, and a max pick of 443. So – Piamps is getting uh, kind of more of the helium, uh, but I like Abner Rebe as the better value. I feel like from Piamps, we've kind of seen what he has been, uh, you know, kind of a little bit of a journeyman, 29 years old. I think maybe him and Uribe split, but uh, I, I don't think it's there's gonna be, a clear. It's going to be, it's, it's be Trevor McGill, I think. Uh, you honestly. think so? I, yeah, I think, and I think, and I think why, I'll tell you why. Uh, I think Piamps is another one of those types of middle relievers who had a great season. And then, you know how those guys fall apart the next year? They don't usually survive. Piamps was really good last year, but there was a lot of smoke and mirrors there. Um, And he did a really nice job for them. Uribe is a young guy, but like I already said before, this is a a, a team that likes to control our eligible type of guys and keep that value down. He's also really young and doesn't have a lot of experience. What McGill brings to the table is something that's a little bit nastier uh, when you kind of dive in and take a look. Um, he had a 35% K percentage last year. Another journeyman guy who all of a sudden just added um, just incredible velocity to his game. And so uh, the last we heard last week was that, you know, uh, Pat Murphy had said, well, you know, the best candidates are Uribe, McGill, and Piamps. It's like, well, no shit, Sherlock. Like, you know, <laughs> yeah, those are your best options. But um, I, I, he, he doesn't. He says he's not going to name a closer. I guess we're going to have to watch it. I would lean McGill. He's thirty. Uh, Piamps is better in a setup role, and Uribe is young. So I, well, I guess we'll see what happens. Yeah, it's uh, you know, I think more with closing and relief pitchers, that's something that you have to stay on more than anything else. And and coming from experience when we do, you know, TGI, FBI and the earth leagues, I feel like the person that's going to be up in line for save opportunities uh, are snatched up pretty quick. Yeah. So just something to monitor, but 
Fellas, good pod. We're hitting the hour mark. Uh, we are one week away from everybody's opening day, but baseball has started, so there is some right in the world. Uh, before we get out of here, uh, anything you guys would like to pot, to plug, uh, Mike, some of the great work that you're doing? Jeez, I feel like all I do is work and then write about baseball, yeah, which is pretty, which is a pretty good thing to do, right? So, yeah, so I, you know, I'm I'm working at Fan Traps. I cover the bullpens there. I'll have a piece coming out this weekend with the updated charts, uh, looking at the closers, the guys that are uh, holds candidates, and then also sleepers in every bullpen for all thirty teams. And I also started writing at Rotoballer, and I'm gonna have a weekly percent of leagues for for people to be looking for uh, some starting pitching help on those. And then obviously I host the fantasy baseball beat housed by you guys edited by Artie every week. Thank you. Um, with the uh, irrepressible Chris Torres, who is a really Yankee fan right now. I bug him every day about the Yankees and he's uh, very, very, very angry and upset tomorrow night. We have Gary Phillips on to talk about the Yankees Ooh. on the podcast. So, um, thank you guys again for it, not only having me, but also for hosting us with the podcast and giving us our start doing that. It's, it's been a lot. If you couldn't tell by all of that, a lot of fun. Mike and, drinks, um, yeah, if you couldn't tell by all that, Mike Carter drinks a lot of coffee. I do drink a lot of coffee. I haven't had any coffee since about nine o'clock this morning though. So, wow, that's uh, amazing. I'm just, I'm just an energetic guy. I'm I'm so grateful to even be part of these things. You guys have four years ago. I had hadn't done anything, and I started writing because it was COVID, and I got lucky, and I fell into a couple of great places. Last week, I was in New York City drafting a team in Tout Wars. I mean, it's just insane. Like, I'm just having a great time with it. I always remind myself. I always remind myself like this could all vanish like a fart in the wind, you know. So it's like. It's super fun to do it. I really appreciate you guys giving me an opportunity to do something that I would lo- I love doing and uh, and love talking with you guys all the time. I appreciate it. Yeah. If there's one thing, the fantasy baseball community, minimal drama most of the time and just maximum <laughs> love. But for everybody that tunes in to Triple Play, watches not only our baseball, but our fantasy basketball, our fantasy football content, tunes into the fantasy baseball beat, tunes up, tunes into the uh, call up when it comes on. We appreciate that. And if you haven't already, please like, and subscribe to the channel and uh, watch some of the other great videos that we have coming out, especially the position previews. Um, But at this point next week, we'll be talking some baseball, probably not me because I'll be celebrating those opening day, but David and Marty should be back and I'll steal David's line by saying, we're going to make like a bread truck and haul these buns. Enjoy baseball, everybody. We're back.